Okay, hello everyone. I think we are live on Facebook. <clears throat> Hi. Okay. Hi, Mr. M. How are you? Hi, good evening, Miss Gladys. Good evening, everyone, to the Philippines and good afternoon, Middle East. Okay, so Mr. M, I've heard that we have someone who is special who will be doing a lecture tonight. Yes, we are privileged and honored that we have a renowned speaker or a viewer from the Philippines. And I am glad that I will be introduced my viewer for today. Wait. <laughs> Wait, because my son is here. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, he was born precocious. Uh, he started his kindergarten or education at the age of three year old at the University of Immaculate Conception. In the same institution, he spent 10 years of primary and secondary learning in 2003, and he graduated from high school at the age of 15 and was recognized as class valedictorian for mid 22 awards. Imagine that, he's glad. He initially studied in the University of the Philippines in Mindanao, aspiring for a degree in communication arts. Two semesters transpired and he earned the highest general weighted average in the history of University of Mindanao. This elevated him as the top student of University of Mindanao for that semester. To pursue a career in mass communication, he decided to transfer to the University of the Philippines in Diliman to take up communication research. To augment the meager allowance, he ended up being a working student at the age of 18. That was, he was first taught IELTS at the review center and had three other part-time jobs. Okay. In spite of working like a horse with four jobs while in school, he managed to get a 4 plus 1.0 in semester that resulted in him being inducted to be the P Gamma. Mu International Honor Society and P. Kama P. Highest International Honor Society when he was only in third year. Due to his exceptional scholastic achievement, he earned a magna cum laude standing in his course at Bachelor of Arts in Communication Research, a quota course offered in the University of the Philippines. Exactly 18 months prior to his college graduation, he opened his own business, 9.09 Review Center, when he was just 19 years old. For 14 years now, 9.09er has been officially awarded by IELTS IDP OETA's testing hub and PTE person as the number one English Review Center nationwide. Now, at age 33, he has six. Supervised 60 instructor from 9.09ers with online enrollees from all habitable continents. For all his achievements at such a young age, he was awarded by the University of the Philippines as the youngest distinguished alumnus for communication innovation. So, Ms. Gladys, without further ado, we're glad to introduce to you our speaker for tonight's lecture, Mr. Irvin Neal Temporal of 9.09ers Review Center. Welcome, Sir Irvin. Hello. Sound check, check. Mic one, two. Let me just double check. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, Sir Irvin. Yes, we do. But I'm not sure why I cannot see my video. Mm -hmm. Can you see me, Pa? Not yet. Not yet, sir. Mm -hmm. One moment. Uh, start video. Why is this dark? Uh huh. BB. Where the help? <laughs> I, I'm not sure why I cannot see myself, but it says here that I started the video sharing already. Uh huh. It's okay. Mm, maybe I'm not one of the hosts. Is that the reason why I'm trying to figure this out? One moment. You are, sir. You are a co-host. 
in one moment. So, Miss Gladys, how was your preparation before? I would say that I've done all of the, I would say I, I've done all the things that a student can do. Uh, was especially procrastinating. <laughs> so, <laughs> however, when I was already in despair mm -hmm. to, to have that desired band score that I needed Check. for my uh, visa screen, I managed to work hard for it because I know for a I fact know. that if if we are um, if we are if we work for our dreams, definitely we will get it. So after that. And then doing some practices with other groupmates, I managed to finally get that seven. So yeah. <laughs> I'm thankful for this group. So yeah. Oh, so, here's Sir Irvin. Hi, Sir Irvin. Hi, Sir Irvin. I was able to solve the technical problem, the slight technical glitch. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So are you ready, sir? Of course. Okay, so take it away. Okay, first things first, I'd like to thank IELTS Filipino Nurses Group for inviting me to speak to you guys for free for tonight. And so, you know, for the fact that there are four subtests in the IELTS, there is listening, reading, writing, speaking, but speaking is the most important subtest for nurses. And you might want to ask why. One thing's for sure. If you get a nine in listening, reading, and writing, but your speaking is 6.5, then that means to say you do not qualify for any destination. However, if you get a seven in speaking, even with a six in listening, reading, and writing, then you are assured of a destination, and that's the United States of America. That's why I'd like to thank Sir Jeff for inviting us here the moderators, the admin, uh, Miss Gladys, Sir Marben, and also thanks to Miss Jess for introducing me to the group. Now, I want this to be lively and I need your participation, okay? So first things first, sound check. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, there you go. So I need, I just want to know, where are you guys tonight? Okay, kindly type your location. We want this to be participative. Let's take a look at the locations of our attendees for tonight. We see that we have 51 participants in our Zoom meeting. Okay, so Philippines, Mindanao, oy, maayong gabi eh, to my fellow Mindanao non. So we have participants from Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, Iloilo, Cebu. Okay, we're international. Now, I understand, oh, we also have from Kuwait and Papua New Guinea. There is a participant from Baguio, Dubai. Okay, good evening, Philippines. Good afternoon, Middle East. Now, for my next question, I know for a fact that most of you are targeting the United States of America. It's just that. Do we have anyone here targeting the other destinations apart from the United States? If you are considering a country uh, apart from U.S., kindly type it in the chat box. So the six countries requiring an English examination, there is US, UK, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So we have three participants targeting UK, and then Argyphil is planning to go to England, which is part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Now, do we have anyone targeting Australia, Canada, Ireland, or New Zealand? And I need to ask this question because the English examination that you are supposed to take actually depends on your destination. So of these, uh, of these six destinations, I actually recommend IELTS if you're planning to go to U.S. or Canada. I'm recommending OET if you are targeting U.K. or Ireland. However, I'd like to recommend PTE or Pearson Test of English if you are planning to go down 
under, that's Australia or New Zealand. Now, as I have noticed, the people in this class are considering only two destinations, and they are U.S. and U.K. Now, let's compare the two. Let's talk about the English examinations accepted in USA and UK. Class, if you are targeting United States of America and you are a nurse applying for a visa screen, then it has to be the academic module of the IELTS. Well, I'm sure that you have heard before, OET is accepted in some states in USA, but not all states accept OET. That is why if you're applying, if you are applying for U.S. visa screen, then it must be the academic module of the IELTS that you must take. Now, what if you are targeting U.K.? U.K. is accepting two English examinations. There is IELTS academic module and the second one is OET. Now, what if you are 100% sure that you want to go to the United States of America, then your only option is IELTS. If you are targeting UK, then it's between the two, either, uh, either IELTS academic or the second option, which is OET. But if you are planning to go to UK, then my suggestion is you take OET. You'll find out later why as we're go going to compare the two examinations. Now, we are done comparing US and UK when it comes to the English examination, which is accepted. But what about the passing score? Okay, FYI guys, IELTS is not a pass or fail examination. In fact, the moment you get a hold of your IELTS result, it won't tell you congratulations, you passed the examination. Or your IELTS result won't tell you, sorry, better luck next time. What is it that your IELTS result will tell you? It clearly indicates, okay, this is your score. These are your scores in the four subtests. That's why we want you to know it might be possible you passed the examination for one country, but your scores might not be enough for another destination. That is why. What is the suggestion? It is best that you aim for seven in all subtests. Why? With seven in all subtests, you have unlimited options. You can go to US, UK, Canada, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand. However, if you don't get seven in all of the components, but you have a seven in speaking, that is accepted in the United States of America. So now, let's take a look at this one. How to get 6.5 overall band score? Well, it's simple. You just have to aim for a six in listening, a six in reading, a six in writing, and a seven in speaking. That will give you 6.5 overall band score. Now, some people are asking, sir, what if I get 5.5 in writing? Can I still go to the United States of America? Let us ask the 53 Zoom participants and the 115 Facebook Live viewers. Can you go to the United States with a grade of 5.5 in writing? Yes or no? I'll wait for your answer. Okay, from D, absolutely yes, you are correct. Because U.S. does not care whatever grade you get in listening, reading, writing for as long as your overall band score is 6.5. Now, what if you got 5.5 in writing? Well, it's very simple. You have to redeem yourself by doing better in another component. So say, for instance, you got a 6.5 in listening, a 6 in reading, 5.5 in writing, and a 7 in speaking. That will still give you 6.5 overall band score. Now, what if you got 5.5 in both reading and writing? It's totally fine. For as long as your speaking is 7, your listening is 7, the overall band score is still 6.5. That is why if I were you, I need you to focus on the speaking subtest because this is the most important subtest for nurses. Now, 
I promised to Sir Marvin and Miss Gladys that for tonight, we're going to talk about statistics. I hope you will understand where I'm coming from. Well, that's because I am not a nurse by profession. In fact, I am not an English teacher. But as I was introduced earlier, I finished a degree in BA Communication Research. That is a statistical writing course. That is why in all of my discussions, I always anchor on statistics. Now, let me check how well informed our participants are for tonight. Class, you know, for a fact that IELTS is graded numerically from one to nine. Now, will you please tell me what is the national average of Filipinos in the speaking subtest, where nine is the highest and one is the lowest? Let's take a look at your intelligent guesses. Can someone tell me? Okay, Kel Poyawan said it's 6.5. M, uh, Mr. M, 6.5. Gretzel, 6.8. D, 6.5, 6.3, 6.5 to 7, 6.3. Okay. Now, I want you to check the website of IELTS. That's www.ielts.org. And there you will find the performance of the candidates worldwide. It is further subdivided into four subjects. So listening, reading, writing, and speaking national average. In fact, one of you got it correctly. Let me just go back. Mm -hmm. I think it's my fellow Mindanao non Gretzel May. If my memory serves me right, Gretzel earlier mentioned that uh, he or she is from Mindanao, 6.8 is the national average. Now, let us do the mathematics. Seven is the required band score for nurses to go to America. But if 6.8 is the national average grade of Filipinos in speaking, will you please tell me now, common sense, how many percent of Filipinos planning to go to the United States can actually get the required band score of seven in speaking? It doesn't have to be the exact percentage, but just look at this. National average is 6.8, but the target is seven in speaking. So please give me the percentage of the Filipinos who can get the required band score in speaking when going to the United States. 0% as the lowest and 100% as the highest. Guys, participation. Because tonight, it's not about me. It's about you. We want to bring out the best in you. Okay. Archfell said that 100% or all Filipinos who are targeting USA can get the required band score. Mm, I'm sorry, but I don't think so. Why? Imagine seven is the target, but an average Filipino can only get 6.8. So do the mathematics. Mm -hmm. So someone said 78%, 98%, 90%, 75%, 60%. Let's do it this way. An average person gets 6.8, which means to say less than half of Filipinos planning to go to the United States get the required band score in the speaking subtest. Now, you're going to ask me, so how come you knew about this? So FYI, ladies and gentlemen, I am not a, a newbie, I'm not a novice in the IELTS. In fact, as I was introduced earlier, I started teaching IELTS in May of 2006, which means to say this year, this exact month, I'm celebrating my 15th year as an IELTS reviewer. So almost half of my life, because I'm 33 now, almost half of my life, I have devoted to this English examination. So... It was in 2017 when I was sent to Shanghai, China to meet Dr. Joanna Mohoram, one of the big bosses of IELTS in Singapore, and Dr. Victoria Clark, one of the big bosses of IELTS in Asia. During that international conference from December 1 to 5, 2017 in Shanghai, China, I met with the most important people in IELTS all over Asia. So as the lone representative of the Philippines at that time, I got the golden opportunity to talk to the big bosses of IELTS and know about the performance of our candidates in each of the four criteria. That is why later we are going to talk about 
the four criteria in the speaking subtest, namely fluency, pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar, and talk about which criterion we Filipinos usually get the highest average and in which criterion are we not so good at. Remember, I promise that we're going to talk about statistics because statistics means the world to us. The only way to move forward is to base our preparation on studies. So now we already know that seven is the target of nurses going to USA, but 6.8 is the national average. Now let's talk about the format of the speaking subtest. Before we continue, I want to check how many of you guys are planning to take computer-delivered exams. So FYI, we have two types of IELTS, paper-based and computer-delivered. So paper-based IELTS was first introduced in 1989, and you heard me right. IELTS is older than some of you because right now, or this year, IELTS is actually turning 32 years old. What about computer-delivered exam? Computer-delivered IELTS was first introduced to Asia two to three years ago. So if you're going to compare the two, paper-based IELTS, 31 to 32 years old, while computer-delivered IELTS, two to three years old. Now, this is what some people are thinking of. You know what? I am shy. I don't want to talk to a human being. I'd rather talk to a computer. That's why I'm planning to take computer-delivered IELTS. Ladies and gentlemen, and that is a misconception. Why? Because speaking subtest is the only one that is not conducted in front of a computer before COVID-19. But now, because of this global pandemic, in certain locations, say for instance, in parts of the Middle East and in parts of the Philippines, where there are no local examiners, the speaking subtest is conducted via Zoom. So clarification, you are going to take IELTS in front of a computer, but still you're talking to a human being. Now, we have like one, two, or three people who raised their hands and said that, okay, I'm planning to take computer-delivered exam. So before I'm going to compare computer-delivered speaking versus paper-based speaking, let's talk about listening, reading, and writing very briefly, okay? Paper-based listening Obviously, you're given a test booklet, which will serve as your scratch paper at the same time. After listening to the recording and answering the questions on the test booklet, the test supervisor will give you 10 extra minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. It's just that this is not the case in computer-delivered IELTS. Why? That is because for computer-delivered IELTS, it is totally up to the test supervisor whether you will be given time to review your work and transfer your answers. So based on the experience of our reviewees who took the examination in the last two to three years, certain test supervisors give the candidates two extra minutes after listening to the recording. What to do in the two minutes? Review your work. But FYI, you don't need to transfer your answers to the answer sheet because in the first place, you are using QWERTY keyboard in answering the questions. So certain test supervisors don't give extra time. Like after 30 minutes of listening to the recording and answering the questions, some test supervisor go immediately to the reading subtest. Now, what's the difference between the two? For a computer-delivered exam, everyone is provided an individual headset. That is always the case in computer-delivered IELTS. It's just that for a paper-based examination, there are certain cities that use headsets, while other cities use the sound system type. In the Philippines, the cities that use individual headsets are definitely all the locations in Metro Manila, there is Metro Cebu and Baguio. For other locations, it's the sound system type. Eventually, it's in the pipeline of both IDP and British Council to ensure that all candidates will be using individual headsets. But as of now, 
only the premier cities or the candidates in the premier cities get to take the examination with individual headsets. What about the reading subtest? For pen and paper IELTS, you're given one hour to read the passage, answer the questions, and transfer the answers to the answer sheet. Now, for pen and paper IELTS, apparently you have Mongol number two. So you can underline and highlight the keywords. But what about computer delivered IELTS? You're not given any scratch paper. You're not given any Mongol number two. So how, can, how possibly can you highlight the keywords in the passage by using computer mouse? Now, I'd like to check how many of you have poor eyesight like me? I am nearsighted with an eye grade of 320. Anyone here with poor eyesight? Kindly comment me. Let me take a look. How many of you guys have poor eyesight? Okay, so Gretzel has poor eyesight like me. Why am I asking this question? For the simple reason that if you're going to take computer-delivered IELTS, you are given the chance to adjust the font size and adjust the font color, which is not possible if you're going to take pen and paper IELTS. Now, another advantage if you're going to take uh, rather, if you're going to take computer-delivered IELTS. For pen and paper IELTS, you're going to flip from one page to another. And sometimes there is a possibility that the questions are not in the same page as the passage. The questions might be on the next page. However, if you're going to take computer-delivered IELTS, the screen is divided into two. The left-hand side portion of the screen, there you will find the passage. The right-hand side portion of the screen, there you will find the question. So instead of flip-flopping from one page to another, what do you do? You scroll up and you scroll down. And this is advantageous because there is a possibility for you to put the exact portion of the passage where you get to find the answer directly side by side with the question. So it's much easier to identify the keywords or in certain cases, you read between the lines. So this is an advantage, a feature possible in computer-delivered exam that you can never do for pen and paper IELTS. Now, what about the writing subtest? Task one, you are required to write at least 150 words. For task two, at least 250 words. Now, a lot of people are asking, sir, how do we know our, uh, how do we know how many words we have written? Well, for pen and paper IELTS, you are on your own to determine whether you have reached the minimum. But life is a bit easier if you're going to take computer-delivered examination. Why? All you have to do is to direct your attention to the lower right-hand side portion of the screen, and there you will find word count. It will give you an idea how many words you have written so far. That is why you don't have to waste time unnecessarily to count the words words that you have written because word count feature is available in computer delivered exam. Class, I give my personal Facebook account, my personal email ad. So literally every single day, I respond to messages sent to me as early as 7.30 a.m. all the way to 11.30 p.m. And that's seven days a week. Now, I've noticed that Filipinos are very creative. And I'd like to share with you some of the questions that I received from our reviewees. Like number one, a reviewee asked me, so sir, if I'm going to take computer-delivered IELTS, are they going to check the, uh, are they going to suggest synonyms? Or number two, Sir, is there a spelling check function if I am going to take computer delivered IELTS? Now, before I answer these two questions, I'm going to throw the question back at you guys. Do you think computer delivered IELTS will suggest synonyms and correct the words that you did not spell correctly? Yes or no? GB said no, Jura no, Joyce no. It is obvious. Come to think about it. Why are they going to assess your proficiency in English if in the first place they are going to suggest, suggest synonyms or they are going to check your spelling? So it's not as if you're using Microsoft Word when you take IELTS Computer Delivered Exam. What you see is a simple notepad. So you're on your own to think of the synonyms, to check the spelling and so on. Well, my memory serves me right. And there is this message that I will never forget. 
So a review he asked me, sir, what if I take the computer delivered examination and right in the middle of the examination, sir, nag brown out. What will happen to the essay that I have written? And that's when I realized, wow, ang taba ng utak ng mga Pinoy, di ba? Grabe ang imagination. Naisip talaga nila that there might be a possibility of brown out or power interruption in the writing exam or in the written subtests. Well, the promise according to British Council and IDP, whatever last word you have typed prior to the power interruption, this will be saved automatically to the system such that when power comes back, that last word that you have written, this is where you continue with the rest of the essay. You don't have, you don't have to start from scratch. Well, at least that is something good to know for those who are taking the computer delivered examination. Now, what about the speaking subtest? Because earlier I told you that we're going to focus on speaking tonight as it is the most important subtest for the nurses. Well, let's take a look at the situation in the Philippines before we go to overseas uh, testing centers, okay? For Filipino candidates, if you are going for for candidates taking the examination in the Philippines. If you're going to pick computer-delivered exam, the guarantee is you get to finish all the four subtests in one day. How does this work? For the written exams, listening always for, uh, comes first, followed by reading and then writing. So speaking is the only subtest in the IELTS that is not conducted together with the written exams. And what is the explanation what is very simple everyone gets to listen read and write all at the same time but apparently not everyone gets to talk all at the same time that is why there is a specific schedule for each test taker in the speaking component now the question is when is the speaking subtest for a computer delivered exam if you choose the morning session like 9 a.m to 12 noon for the written exams definitely you're going to have the speaking subtest in the afternoon Worst case scenario, if there are plenty of candidates, you might have the speaking subtest in the evening. Well, that will depend on the number of candidates, but because we still need to maintain social distancing in testing centers right now, I doubt if someone will be scheduled for a speaking examination in the evening, knowing that testing centers are only allowed to function at maximum of 30% capacity. Now, if you're going to take the written examinations in the afternoon, that's from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., definitely you're going to have a speaking subtest in the morning. So that is the promise of British Council and IDP that you get to complete all the four subtests in one day. And I bet this is helpful for people who are working. We know for a fact that it's very difficult to file for a leave from work. So if you are working, it's best that you choose computer delivered examination because you don't have to go back to the examination venue on a different day. But what if you're going to take paper-based examination? It totally depends on the number of candidates. But the usual promise of British Council and IDP, the speaking subtest may fall on one of the three days. It could be the day before your examination, it could be on the same day as your written exams, or the day after. FYI, one IELTS examiner interviews up to how many candidates, okay? I don't want to give that information just yet, so I need you to guess. Will you please tell me how many candidates do you think are being interviewed by one examiner in one day, okay? Let me take a look at your guesses. Okay, IFNG said 10. What about the others? Guys, we need your participation. This is not a monologue. This is a lecture. Okay, Camille, 30. Gretzel, 30. Mr. M, 15, 20, 10. Okay, for the answer. One IELTS candidate is allotted maximum of 20 minutes for the interview. That's the maximum. There are breaks in between. So, one IELTS examiner interviews up to, okay, 25. That is the maximum number of speaking candidates assigned to one examiner. Now, you might ask me, so, sir, how come you know this, but you are not an IELTS examiner? Well, it's simple. 
because I've worked with IDP and British Council since I opened Niner in April of 2007. I know the alphabet of the examiners from A to Z. From A, examiner Astillero, Iris, to Z, examiner Zerkwitz Philip, I know all of them by heart. Now, speaking of these examiners, FYI, these examiners who are assigned to the Philippines might be assigned to a different Asian country. They might be assigned to Africa, uh, the Pacific, and so on. So just because they're examiners here it doesn't mean that their capacity or authority is only limited to the Philippines. Now, I want you to guess how many examiners do you think are, okay, how many speaking examiners do you think are there in the Philippines, okay? Give me your realistic guess. How many speaking examiners? FYI, the person you are talking to in the speaking subject is the one grading you. So, IFNG, guest 30, Cookie 50, iPad 20, Master G 30, Arjifel, 30, Mr. M, 45, Antoinette, 20. Okay, the answer, dun, 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 approximately 35 speaking examiners in the Philippines. A common question that I received from the review is, so sir, how, uh, where am I supposed to take the examination if I don't want to be assigned to a Filipino examiner? And my response, you want to make sure that you won't be assigned to a Filipino examiner, then take the examination in Zimbabwe. Then, magagalit. And I said, well, obviously, if you're going to take the examination in the Philippines, there is a possibility that you're going to be assigned to a Filipino examiner because where are you taking the test? In the Philippines. That's why there are local examiners. Now, we have 35 examiners. That's the approximate number. How many do you think are white examiners? Well, IELTS is a test of English. So most people think that the examiners are white. Now, let's take a look at the guesses of the participants. IFNG 10, iPad 5, Master G 5, Joyce 10, uh, Jura 10, 10, 10, and so on. Okay. Based on my last count, okay, we have more than 20 Filipino examiners and less than 15 white examiners in the Philippines. Why am I giving you this? as an idea. Because of the almost 35 examiners, speaking examiners in the Philippines, I have met more than 20 of them. I have attended their speaking workshops, writing workshops, and I'm planning to share my knowledge tonight. Whatever I have learned from the examiners I met in person, they form the backbone of my lectures. Because I just don't want to quote, you know, from myths or misconceptions. I always base my lectures on statistics and first-hand information. In fact, when I started teaching IELTS in 2006, my first boss was an IELTS examiner. The nitty-gritty details I've learned about this examination, I did not get from books. I did not get from the internet. I did not get from YouTube, but I learned first-hand from an IELTS examiner. That's why what I'm sharing with you is certified uh, information from credible experts, the ones who are conducting the examination. So going back to what I was saying, we have almost 35 examiners in the Philippines, more than 20 are, uh, more than 20 are Filipinos, less than 15 are white. One examiner gets to talk up to 25 candidates in one day. So the earliest possible start of the speaking subject is 8 a.m. Now, what about the last time slot in speaking? It's 9.40 to 10 p.m. You heard me right. 9.40 to 10 p.m. That's the latest possible schedule in the speaking subject. Now, some people might be thinking when they receive a phone call coming from the representative of IDP and British Council, if the rep says, oh, hello, you're going to take your speaking examination at 9.45 p.m. And then some Filipinos say, excuse me, did, did I hear it right? Did you just say uh, PM or do you mean 9.40 AM? No, that is really the last speaking test for the day, 9.40 to 10 PM. 
The question is, when will you find out your schedule in speaking? It's like this. If you choose computer delivered examination, the moment you register in the website of IDP and British Council, you get to pick your own schedule in speaking. And this is exactly the reason why we recommend that candidates register for the examination at least two to three weeks before the test date. Why? You can pick the best schedule in speaking such that your written exams, say for instance, would end at 12 noon, and then you're not going to have the speaking subtest at 1 p.m. because apparently you still need to eat, you need time to relax. Or if you register for the examination, say for instance, just three days or four days before the test date, well, the only time slot left might be 9.40 p.m. So FYI, it is possible to register for the examination even if it's just four days before the test date, but you may not be able to choose the best speaking schedule. So what do we recommend? Two to three weeks before your target test date, that is the best time to register for the exam. So for computer-delivered IELTS, you get to choose your SCED in speaking. But what about pen and paper IELTS? Well, more people take pen and paper IELTS because the capacity for computer-delivered examination, 15 at a time. 15 candidates in the morning, 15 candidates in the afternoon. But for paper-based IELTS, they can rent a big function room, a big ballroom that can accommodate up to 100 people. That's why more people, are, there are more speaking candidates for paper-based IELTS. Now, when will you find out your schedule in speaking? If it's paper-based examination, five days before the written exams. So kindly check your inbox or spam folder because sometimes the email coming from IDP or British Council does not enter the main inbox, but sometimes you get to find it in your spam folder. If four days before the written exams still, you have not received any information or confirmation regarding your speaking schedule, this is when I vehemently encourage you to coordinate with IDP and British Council for you to find out your exact, uh, your specific uh, sched in speaking. So we have just compared paper-based IELTS computer-delivered IELTS, listening, reading, writing, plus the speaking subjects. Well, for speaking, there is not much of a difference except for the schedule. Because if it is computer-delivered exam, you get to finish all the four subtests in one day. But for a paper-based IELTS, there is a possibility that you have to go back to the examination venue on a different day for your speaking subtest. Now, what about the cost of the examination? For IDP, it's 11,300 pesos for both paper-based and computer-delivered exam. However, the British Council recently announced a price increase for the IELTS examination. And now, British Council charges 11,650 pesos for the candidates taking the tests in the Philippines. For our reviewees based in the Middle East, it is best to double check with the local IDP or local British Council how much they charge for the examination. Because FYI, the cost of the IELTS is country specific. It might be a little more expensive in another country. It might be cheaper in another country. That's why you always have to double check with the local IDP and British Council. Now, speaking of IDP and the British Council, now I want to ask, there are 47 participants here in our Zoom meeting room. How many of you or okay. We're going to divide the class into two. How many of you are going to choose IDP and how many of you are planning to take the examination in British Council? After the vote, that's when I'll tell you the difference between the two, okay? Participation. <clears throat> how many are planning to take the exam? In, ah, okay, IDP, BC, IDP, 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 BC, IDP, IDP, IDP. Okay, I guess that's enough response from the crowd. Is there anyone who can comment on the chat box? What do you think is the difference between the two? Is there anyone who can tell me the difference between IDP and British Council? Well, for sure I know the answer, but I don't spoon feed the information right away. Remember, this is a class. I don't get to see you. Okay, so Cookie said location. GL said remarking P. 
Well, yeah, because one testing center charges uh, a little more, a little higher for the remarking fee. But let's forget about remarking, granting that you're going to pass the examination on your first and last attempt. So you don't have to consider remarking anymore. Apart from Cookie, is there anyone else who would like to share his or her thoughts regarding the difference between IDP and British Council? No one? No more? Okay, it's like this. Let's compare IDP and British Council to convenience stores like 7-Eleven and Miniso. What about IELTS? Let's compare IELTS to the coffee that I'm uh, drinking right now. Okay, coffee co iced blanca. So, if you go to 7-Eleven and you buy coffee co iced blanca. Don't be surprised that if you transfer to mini stop, it's exactly the same Copico Ice Blanca that you're going to get. Which means to say, IDP and British Council are not the one making the test papers. It's Cambridge making the test papers. So what then is the function of IDP and British Council? These two testing centers are distributors. So there is no Cambridge office in every country worldwide. That is why for certain locations, only British Council is available. IDP is not an option. For the candidates there, they are left with no choice but to take the examination in British Council. Also, there are certain countries where IDP is the only option. But what about the Philippines? IDP and British Council, these are the two uh, testing centers available. Let's go back to Mini Stop and 7 Eleven. Why is it that some people choose Mini Stop over 7 Eleven, even if they sell exactly the same Copico Ice Blanca? Cookie is actually correct. It's the location. So, where is the British Council office located? If you live in Metro Manila and Taguig, BGC is more accessible for you. That's when we recommend the British Council. So where exactly is the facility of the British Council? The curve building right across St. Luke's Global City. But if you live closer to Ortigas, that's when we recommend you to take the examination in IDP. Class, if you're taking the examination outside of Metro Manila, kindly check the venue. Can we check the hotel, which is considered as the testing center? So yes, it's the location that determines which testing center must you pick for your IELTS exam. Also, the seven, uh, I mean, Copico Blanca in 7-Eleven might not have exactly the same price as the Copico Ice Blanca in Mini Stop. So earlier, I told you that IDP, for now, charges 11300 for the IELTS examination, whereas the British Council charges 11650 So if you think 350 spells a big difference between the two, then go for the testing center, which is more affordable. However, it is a misconception for you to say, okay, let's take the examination in one test center is simply because they offer the easier examination. Level of difficulty is definitely not an issue. It must not be a factor for you to decide which testing center you must pick for your IELTS examination. Okay, so we have talked about uh, listening, reading, writing, pen and paper versus computer delivered exam. Also the schedule for the speaking subjects. What about availability of the results? If you're going to take paper-based IELTS, results are out in 13 calendar days. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you're going to take computer delivered examination, results are out in three to five days. FYI, when we say three to five days, Usually, they don't release results on weekends. So if the third day happens to be Saturday, you have to wait until Monday for the availability of your computer-delivered IELTS result. So for people who are patient, paper-based IELTS might be an option for you. If 13 days, 
is not an issue at all, then go ahead and take computer-delivered IELTS. But for people who are anxious uh, with uh, panic attack, you cannot wait for 13 days before the results are out. And that's what I suggest that you take computer-delivered examination because the results are out in just three to five days. Okay. Okay, so we're done here and here and computer delivered exam. We have also discussed the difference between IDP and British Council. Now, for the next part of the discussion, we're going to focus on speaking. The four criteria followed by the three tasks. So before we continue, do we have any question coming from the participants? Okay, any questions so far? It's good that you ask questions because it only means two things if you don't ask questions. Number one, Walang naintindihan or number two, naintindihan lahat. Hopefully, it's the second one. But human as we are, we commit errors and we have short attention spans. So there is a possibility for some people to ask questions because uh, they misunderstood, they were not able to hear it clearly. Okay? So if you want to ask questions before we proceed to speaking uh, before we focus on speaking, please go ahead and share the question. Okay, Cookie said, very clear so far. Thank you for that, Cookie. Anyone else? I just want to make sure that you are still awake. It's just 9.48. Okay, so let's proceed. Mm -hmm. IFNG waiting for the FB viewers. Well, unfortunately, I cannot see the comments of the FB uh, viewers here. But if someone can type the questions of the FB viewers in our chat box, I'd be very glad to answer these questions. Okay, so IFNG question. IDP, my paper base. Will both IDP and British Council offer paper base and computer delivered exam? So IDP conducts paper-based IELTS in a uh, 16 to 18 key cities nationwide for British Council, if I'm not mistaken, less than 15. But what about the cities where computer delivered exam is available? Definitely for Metro Manila, there's Pasay, there's Pasig, and there's uh, Taguig. Okay. Outside of NCR, computer-delivered IELTS facilities are available in Baguio, Cebu, and Dipolog. But if you don't live in one of these locations, uh, Pampanga, sorry, I forgot to mention that the British Council recently uh, launched their computer-delivered examination in Pampanga. But if you don't live in one of those cities or provinces mentioned, then computer-delivered IELTS is not an option, but only paper-based IELTS, okay? So, Cookie said, I'm still awake because of your voice, Char. And then, IFNG to everyone, speaking via Zoom. Okay. So far, based on the experience of our reviewees who took the examination recently, even if uh, the candidates are taking the examination in Metro Manila. They are required to go to the office of IDP. They are required to go to the office of the British Council and take the examination there. But still, it's via Zoom. So where is the examiner? The examiner is in a different room. You have you still need to go to their facility. However, you don't get to meet the examiner face-to-face -face because of COVID-19. Which means to say, it is best that you have to practice uh, talking to your, say, for instance, speaking buddy or your speaking coach via Zoom because that's how it's done in the actual examination right now. Okay, one moment as I read the other questions here. For reading, is it uh, advisable to start with the last, uh, last part because it's a difficult type format? Mm -hmm. For now, I'm going to answer this question, but I hope that uh, IFNG will allow me 
to do this for like five consecutive weeks tonight i'm going to focus on speaking and then next week writing task two and then writing task one the following week and then listening and reading because i want to take my time i don't want to rush when i teach so hopefully it will give me that opportunity in order for me to share with you uh free information related to the ielts uh Guys, it's up to you if you're going to request IFNG to allow me to do this on a weekly basis. But to answer that question earlier, I don't miss Well, it's not as if it's wrong, okay? But I usually tell my reviewees a lot 15 minutes per passage so that the last 15 minutes you get to use this one in reviewing your work and transferring your answers to the answer sheet. But if you want to start with the first passage, go ahead. If you want to start with the third passage, it doesn't really matter. What's most important, you're able to find the 40 answers and review your work in one hour. Okay? So, uh, from Ab uh, Abigail Kamali, why does sometimes when examiners ask questions and you answer it and you're still expanding answers, they are interrupting you and sometimes halt you and proceed to the next question? It makes me anxious. Okay. Well, I spoke to one of my favorite examiners. And when I say favorite, she's really my idol. Professor Rosela Bambi Torrecampo of UP Diliman. And I asked her exactly the same question. So as you can see, I don't answer questions based on my opinion. I share with you the info that I learned from examiners themselves. And this is what I learned from my idol. You don't have to talk for 20 minutes for the examiner to know if your English is good or not. If you respond to one question, with just four sentences, that's good enough for the examiner to know if you are responsive to the question or not. Mind you, it's perfectly normal for the examiner to butt in or to interfere while you are talking. I, for one, took the examination twice. First examiner, Pamela Yu. And second examiner, Sir uh, Manuel Toazon. So for my first IELTS, that was when... I was shocked. I was surprised because Miss Pamela never allowed me to finish my answers. And at the back of my mind, I'm asking myself, does she even like what I'm saying? Because she's not give, giving me any facial expressions, no reactions, and she frequently interferes. But when I got my IELTS result, that was when I was uh, pleasantly surprised that my examiner, who never smiled at me, never showed me any reactions, and frequently interrupted me, gave me a 9.0 in the speaking subtest. So imagine, most speaking exams last for 11 to 14 minutes, but certain examiners ask more than 20 questions, which means to say, the, on the average, 15 questions for the 11 to 14 minute speaking exam. But if one examiner asks more than 20 questions in just an 11 to 14 minute interview, one thing's for sure, there are certain examiners who won't allow you to talk for about one minute while answering one question. So I'll talk about the tips later on, but just to answer the question of Abigail right here, yes, it is normal. It is fine. It's actually expected for the examiners to butt in while you are talking, okay? It doesn't mean that you're going to fail. It's also not a guarantee that you're going to pass. It's just the way it is, okay? Let's take a look at more questions here from G. Sir, nagkakondak na po ba ng Skype speaking test? Kasi Saudi before, a Saudi meron na especially if computer-based. Well, in the Philippines, we're using Zoom. For other countries, they might also be using other app. So it might be Skype, it might be Zoom, but it, it doesn't matter for as long as you're able to talk to your examiner without the physical contact, okay? Antoinette, nakamas ba sa speaking exam? Well, it was just recently when they implemented the speaking examination via Zoom. But before that, when speaking was still conducted face-to-face, -face, like, Last year, apparently all the candidates had to wear face mask. It's just that certain countries now have decided to do it via Zoom, while the others have decided to do it face to face. So Cambridge thought, why not make it uniform for everyone? So whether it's face to face or via Zoom, it's best that you practice with your mask on. 
so that you won't be surprised in the actual examination if you still need to wear your face mask even if the examination is conducted over Zoom. Okay? Okay, so Janine said, please, sir. Well, uh, it's actually in your hands. So you uh, request for IFNG to allow me to present on a weekly basis. That uh, depends on the outcome of our uh, lecture for tonight. If you think that the content is helpful and you want to learn some more, it's just a matter of requesting the admin, the moderators of IFNG to make this our weekly habit. But if you think that you're just wasting your time tonight, then tell them we don't want Niner next week. It's totally fine with me. But one thing's for sure, I'm giving my all whenever I teach. And in fact, when Whenever, whenever I conduct lectures, there's always statistics and there's always uh, words of wisdom from IELTS examiners. And so far, I've just shared one, and that's from examiner Rosella Torrecampo, because we still have not talked about the format of the speaking test and the four criteria. More of that later on. I'm just entertaining questions, okay? So from Jen. out of curiosity, can we combine results from ID and British Council? The answer is yes. Okay, for writing, is it advisable to finish task two first? For Master G, the answer is yes. I'll explain that in the writing portion of our discussion, which might not be tonight. But imagine if writing task two is worth 66% of your grade in writing. And writing task one, 33%. Imagine this one. What if you finished writing task two, but you were not able to finish writing task one? You expect a deduction for that. But kindly compare the deduction when you finish task one, but you're not able to finish task two. The deduction is twice as much because task one is just 33% of your grade, while task two is 66% of your grade. And this is exactly the reason why I always encourage all IELTS examinees to start with writing task two, simply because the weight is twice as much as the value of writing task one. Okay? From Vina Grace Bautista Iglesias. If via Zoom ang speaking, allowed na po alisin ang face mask and face shield during the speaking exam. I, if I'm not mistaken, I answered this earlier. It's so best that you practice with your face mask on because it's totally dependent on the test supervisor per location. Some test supervisors allow you to remove it while the others don't. So we just have to make sure that you're prepared for... Uh, the actual examination, try to practice with your uh, face mask on. Mabel, do you do they require masks? I think that's answered already. Mm -hmm. I'll just answer a few more because we might be running out of time if we answer all of these questions without proceeding to the discussion. Okay? So, yes, sir. From IFNG Weekly Lecture from Niner. Oh, bonga. From all of the moderators, a big yes. Uh-huh. Within six months, lang po ba allotted time, allotted time to combine the score. Okay, to answer the question of EMS, if you're going to the United States, there's no such thing as within six months you have to pass, uh, you have to get a seven in speaking and six point five overall bad score. U.S. does not care for as long as both results are still valid. If you're targeting U.K. or Australia, you must have passed all the subtests within six months. If it's New Zealand, 12 months. So it's totally dependent on the destination, okay? For listening, if I skip something and do not clearly hear and find the answer, what would be the next step? Well, uh, Master G, parang totoong buhay lang to, no? If you missed something, two words, move on. Why? Because this is not a right minus strong examination. If your answer is right, then good for you. If your answer is wrong, apparently, you don't get any deduction for that. It is best to look at what's ahead of you and not behind you. So two words applicable not just in IELTS, but also in real life. Move on. Okay. I guess that's the end of the questions. Now, we, mo we move on to the four criteria in speaking. The first one, it's fluency and coherence. So this criterion pertains to your ability to talk in a natural, free-flowing, and continuous manner. Class, most people think that if you are fluent, it means you are talkative. But for IELTS examiners, that is not necessarily the case. So, I've met IELTS examiner Ian Wall. 
He's one of the examiners in the Philippines, and he has also interviewed candidates in other parts of the globe. And this is what he noticed. Filipinos are clearly very talkative in English. Why? Because for most of us, we speak better English than Tagalog. If I may ask, kinsa sa inyo hadiri ang Bisaya, okay? Taga Visayas, taga Mindanao. Kinsa may dili Tagalog diri? May I see? So M's raised uh, his or her hand. Apart from M's, okay, iPad, me. Jen, me. Jura, me. Okay, Tagal uh, cookie, Tagalog only, sir. Well, why did I ask? It's like this. For people coming from the South, we're more comfortable talking in English as compared to Tagalog. Why? Imagine at home, we speak in straight Bisaya. When we go to school, we speak in straight English. And there is no opportunity for us to communicate in Tagalog all the time. That's why, pardon us if we sound awkward when we speak in Tagalog, when we uh, set foot in Luzon. You have to understand that we don't use this as part of our day-to-day -day conversation. So, IELTS examiners noticed Filipinos are very talkative in speaking. It's just that some of us are not responsive to the question. Okay, I'll give you a perfect example. Can anyone ask me, okay, or ask me any random question? And I'll give you a perfect example of a typical Filipino response. Okay, Nalina, participate. Give me any random question. Which I'll answer for you. I'm waiting. Okay, so Cookie asked, how's your day? Well, that is a typical question in task one. For this particular question, it could be, or I could be giving you a very long answer. But let's try to be more specific. Say, for instance, an IELTS speaking task to task card. Okay, so Mark Gotico asked, define happiness. Okay, this is a typical Filipino response. I am not saying that this is my response, but I've noticed that this is how some of my reviewees answer this question in my last 15 years of teaching IELTS every day. Okay, pay attention to the answer. Okay, Happiness is uh, subjective because for some people, it might mean money. Well, for some people, it might mean a uh, career or success. Now, speaking of money, I really want to earn money because I want to buy uh, the needs and provide for the wants of my family members. And speaking of family members, you know what? My family members... Uh, want to go to other countries. They want to travel. And speaking of traveling, they're, they're thinking of Europe as a destination because Europe is very posh. It's very regal. And speaking of the word regal, the series that comes to mind is uh, Bridgerton. In fact, when I watched that on Netflix, how I wanted to be in, in the shoes of uh, Daphne, who eventually got married to the Duke of Hastings. But speaking of the Duke of Hastings, isn't it ironic that that man is actually Black when Bridgerton was actually shot like ideally a, a century ago? That, that, that was a setting of Bridgerton. Now, going back, what did you notice to my response, okay? Any comment on my response? It started with a question, define happiness, but what went wrong with that sample delivery or sample response? Any idea? Can someone tell me what went wrong with that response? Okay, Mac J is correct. I'm not answering the question. And this is what IELTS examiners noticed. Filipinos are talkative, yeah. But at the back of our mind, this is what we're thinking of. Bahala na. Salita na ako ng salita. Pahahabain ko to ng pahahabain. Wala akong pakialam anong lalabas sa bunga ko basta nagsasalita ako. So, IELTS examiners are not dumb. Most of them are university professors. 
And for non-native speakers, they are required to get a 9 in writing and 9 in speaking. They are smart, which means to say they would know if you're answering the question or not. So for the first criterion, which is fluency, you're expected to provide longer answers. You're expected to provide details. But number two, even more important than delivering long answers, you always have to go back to the question. So even before you open your mouth, you ask yourself, am I answering the question? Now, number three, a lot of my reviewees ask me, sir, what if I have ums? Will I automatically fail in the exam once I have ums? What do you think? Will you fail in the exam if you have ums in speaking? Yes or no? I repeat, will you fail in the speaking subtest if you have ums? Master G answered that question for everyone. No. What are ums anyway? Ums are fillers. They only mean you're still thinking of what you're going to say. So if you watch television, you will notice that native English speakers have ums while they're talking in English. We Filipinos also have ums while we're talking in Tagalog. Does that mean we are poor in our own language? No. It only means to say we are still thinking. So what is the expectation of IELTS examiners? Fewer ums, but not necessarily no ums at all. Class, I need you to discipline yourself. From now on, kindly try to minimize your ums. We want you to have fewer ums. Well, it's, it's possible that you have ums, but you will still pass the speaking subtest. Now, some people ask me, sir, what do you think is the reason why we have plenty of ums? That is because of the grave misconception. Some people think that fluency means speed when in fact this is not true. Remember, the mind is the one thinking of the answer and the mouth is the one delivering the answer. So what is the tendency when you speak too fast? Your mouth goes ahead of your brain and thinking of what you're going to say such that in the end, you get to have so many ums along the way. Class, our friendly reminders for the first criterion, we need you to talk and provide longer answers because in the first place, there is nothing to assess if you do not talk, okay? But number two, don't just talk. Make sure you always go back to the question and you avoid off-topic responses. And number three, okay, most importantly, you minimize your ums. It doesn't mean no ums at all. You don't have to talk too fast. Just make sure that there is, uh, there is a smooth flow in your delivery. Now, let us move on to the second criterion. And what is the second criterion in the speaking subtest? It's pronunciation. A lot of people are asking me, so sir, what's the difference between pronunciation and accent? Pronunciation pertains to the clarity words that come out of your mouth, while accent pertains to the manner of delivery. And it is usually affected by the native tongue or the regional orientation. Now, speaking of accent, there are uh, native accents like American, British, Australian. Question. Are you required to have the native American accent or British accent to pass the speaking subtest? Yes or no? Are you required to have the native American or British accent to pass the speaking subtest? No, 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 you are right. Why? What matters most is that you speak clearly. It doesn't matter if you don't have the American or the British accent. But what's most important, you neutralize the local accent. The objective of every IELTS examinee must be when the examiner closes his or her eyes, the examiner must not have an idea that the person talking is a Filipino. You must not have the nuances of most Filipinos while you're talking in the speaking subtest. Okay? So let us go back to what we're talking about. Class, that's an uh, accent. But what about pronunciation? Fortunately, there are a lot of people today who speak clearly. It's just that. It's quite unfortunate. There are also people with poor pronunciation. And they are those who are said to have some speech defects. Class, if you get what I'm saying, 
some people interchange F and P, B and V, D and TH. So why is this the case? Because if you look at the original abacada, the original Tagalog uh, alphabet only has P, B, D. No F, no V, no TH sound. And that's exactly the reason why. When some of us were introduced to English, we were confused. How come in English there is F, V, and TH? I am letting you know, how do you speak clearly? It's just a matter of opening your mouth. Why? Words, just, words are just air coming out of your mouth. Try to do this randomly while you're talking. Keep on talking and then cover your mouth. You will realize there's air coming out of your mouth. Because like what I've said, words are just air. You want the words to come out really simple. You open your mouth. Speaking of opening your mouth. Well, when I speak, I really make sure that the words come out such that I have to open my mouth as much just to make sure that I'm able to speak clearly. So some people make fun of the way I talk. But you know what? I just have something to share with you. You cannot please everyone. In the same way, even if you do your best, there will always be people who will mock you or discredit you. But remember, guys, don't think of what other people have to say. Because the truth of the matter is, whatever you do, other people will always have something to say. You're not doing this for them. You're doing this for yourself. So if you want to get a safe grade in pronunciation, you just have to open your mouth. Later, I will give you tips on how you can possibly be more conscious of your pronunciation. But now, Criteria number two is not just about accent neutralization. It's not just about pronunciation in general, but it's also the delivery. IELTS examiners notice that they, there are candidates who treat the speaking subjects as a formal interview. So remember, you're not applying for a job. You are not in court interviewed by a lawyer. You are not inside the high school uh, guidance counselor's office because you were caught cutting classes. How are you supposed to visualize the speaking subject? You're talking to your best friend. You're having a dinner date with the person close to your heart, which means to say you must not sound formal, but you have to sound conversational. Now, what about nervousness? To a certain extent, this affects our performance in the actual examination. As IELTS examiners say, there are only two kinds of people in the actual examination. Those who are nervous and make it more obvious that they are nervous. By doing what? They don't look at the examiner. They look at the ceiling. They look at the wall. And they sound as if they're going to vomit or they sound as if they're suffocated. Class, well, the second type of IELTS candidates in the actual examination, they are those who are nervous, but keep it to themselves, okay? Relax. Imagine that you are not being assessed because the more you treat this as an examination, the more you become conscious. Enjoy the speaking subtest. I repeat, not formal, but we expect a conversational approach. So let's go back to our lessons for the second criterion. How do you ensure that you pronounce clearly? You open your mouth. What about the accent? You are not required the native accent, but you just have to neutralize the local accent. And number three, not formal, but rather conversational. So the first two criteria Fluency and pronunciation are the ones that assess your delivery. The next two criteria, lexical resource and grammatical range and accuracy, are the two criteria that assess the quality of your English. So FYI, lexical resource and grammatical range and accuracy are two criteria assessed in both writing and speaking. So whatever I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes, they're also applicable in the writing subtest. Okay? One moment. I just need my copy call ice blanca.
Okay, let's talk about lexical resource. In simple terms, this is vocabulary. More than anything, your words must be correct. That's the bottom line, okay? Accuracy more than anything else. But number two, it's not enough that you are correct. There has to be variety. Why? Even if your words are right, but you're using exactly the same words in your essay, and you're using the same words in your speaking response for the 11 to 14 minute speaking examination, chances are you won't get a seven for vocabulary. So two main ingredients. Number one is accuracy and number two, variety. Please don't be repetitive and redundant. Now, before we proceed, may I ask, is there anyone in this class? We have 46 Zoom participants. We have 169 FB Live viewers. Can someone please tell me the difference between repetitive and redundant? Anyone? Any volunteer? Okay, we encourage participation. No right or wrong answer. I just want you to speak your heart out. What's the difference between repetitive and redundant? Mm -hmm. Maybe the others are still typing. Let's give them time. What's the difference between repetitive and redundant? Okay, repetitive, according to Gretzel, same words. That's correct. Redundant, same meaning. Perfect, Gretzel name. So, I'll give you an example of something that is repetitive. Say, for instance, the word crucial, okay? In your first sentence, you used the word crucial. In your next sentence, you said most crucial. Now, third sentence, you said uh, crucially. Okay, I tell you, nothing's wrong with the word crucial. It's just that. The word crucial can easily be replaced, which means to say, if you want to use exactly the same word in your next sentence, why don't you think of something different, like vital? You want to repeat that word in the next sentence? Settle for something like essential. You want to use it for the fourth time? Why not say integral? So crucial, vital, essential, integral, they're somehow related to each other, we need you to build your vocabulary in order for your examiner not to accuse you of repetition. Now, what about redundant? Common Filipinoisms that IELTS examiners have noticed. Number one, for uh, like, for example. And why is this redundant? When you write or say like, you're already stating an example. So you don't put the two of them together, like and for example. Drop either of the two, but don't you write or say like, for example. Another example of something redundant, in my own opinion. Imagine, my is your. Own is your. So it's like saying, in my, my opinion. How are we supposed to correct this redundant expression? A common Filipinoism. Why not just say or write, in my opinion? You don't have to put my and own together. Okay? Now, what about this one? We've explained the difference between repetitive and redundant. But someone asked me, so, sir, you know what? I'm not satisfied with a seven. The reason why I'm preparing hard for this examination is because I want the highest possible grade in the examination so that I can announce to the whole wide world, hey, hi, I'm a niner in IELTS. So how can I possibly get a nine? Well, when I spoke to one of the IELTS examiners of the British Council, this is what I learned from uh, the workshop of Jeric Aguilar, okay? If you are able to use words in their not so common context, then there is, a, if you're able to use them correctly, then there is a possibility for you to get a higher grade for lexical resource. They don't have to be big words, but something uncommon. So let's compare common versus creative. Okay, 
common in the past. Why is it that whenever people pertain to something that is part of history, we always write or say, in the past? Well, nothing's wrong with in the past. It's just that it's overused. It's gas gas na. So someone asked me, so sir, how are you going to express uh, in the past using your own words? Well, I love this example because this is a perfect phrase that's filled with, uh, this is a perfect phrase that is uncommon. There is creativity without the need for big words. So at a time that was, look at the five words, at a time that was. Individually, these words are easily understood by grade school pupils. At a time that was. Simple words, right? But when you put the five of them together, it's not as if you get to encounter IELTS candidates who say, at a time that was in the speaking subtest. So this is according to Jerry Aguilar, will invite the examiner to give you a higher grade in the speaking subtest when you're able to employ creativity in such a way that it is still presented in a natural and uh, in a natural manner. Okay, you, you don't sound as if you're trying to impress your examiner because I tell you, examiners have such high qualifications. So it's not as if you're trying to prove something to your examiner. You just have to be understood by the examiner. So now let us move on to, or let us go back to vocabulary and lexical resource as a criterion. More than anything else, the words must be correct. Number two, avoid repetition and avoid redundant expressions. But number three, if you are not satisfied with seven, you want a higher grade for lexical resource, then it's time for you to settle for uncommon words or uncommon phrases, but they don't have to be complicated English. Now, let's move on to the last criterion, grammatical range and accuracy. So for grammar, the common areas of difficulty, there's subject-verb agreement, there's consistency of verb tenses, and there is use of prepositions. Now, let's talk about subject-verb agreement. Everyone was taught in elementary that if the subject is singular, the verb must also be singular. A plural subject requires a plural verb. We know that already, but why is it that up until now, we can't get it right? especially in the speaking subtest. Well, it's like this. In writing, there is time for you to go back to your work. But in speaking, you're not given preparation time in task one and task three. You just have to open your mouth. You just have to talk, talk, and talk. So a friendly reminder. In the speaking subtest, the moment you recognize a mistake, correct yourself right away. Because that will give the examiner the impression that, hey, I actually know what's right. But because this is the speaking subject, I'm not given enough time to prepare. Human as I am, there is a possibility, there is a tendency for me to commit a mistake. But now I remembered what's right. That's why I'm correcting myself. So say, for instance, what if you say, one of my favorite restaurants, oh, sorry, one of my favorite restaurants. So one of the is always followed by a plural na. So the moment you recognize the mistake, correct yourself right away and remind the examiner, hey, I actually know what's right. That's why I'm correcting myself. What about consistency of verb tenses? If you're asked to talk about something that's related to the past, then you have to stick to the past tense all throughout the response. The problem with certain IELTS candidates, they time travel from one tense to another, from present tense to past tense, back to present tense to past tense. You cannot do that. So you have to be careful with the question. Is it asking you to share an experience that happened before? Is it asking you to talk about something that you do regularly? Or is this asking you to mention something that you're planning to do in the future? Be careful because verb tenses, if there is some inconsistency, will definitely pull you down for grammatical range and accuracy. Now, what about prepositions? If there is one aspect pulling us down as a nation, 
definitely prepositions. And we have no other reason to blame but the national language. Why? Tagalog. We have a very convenient preposition, preposition to use, and that is sa. Class, I'll give you a perfect example, okay? <clears throat> Let me mention this sentence twice, one in Tagalog, and then I'll translate it in English later on. Let's begin. Ako po ay nakatira sa Block 10, Lot 9, sa kalye ng Pikampa, sa Lungsod ng Maynila. Now it's time for us to translate this to English. Okay, here we go. I live at Block 10, Lot 9 on P Campus Street in Manila City. So what did you notice? That sa is in, sa is at, sa is on. Instead of making your life complicated, I would rather that you go back to the basics. You have to know when to use in, at, on, by, with, to, for. This is your passport in getting that required band score in the speaking subtest. So for grammar, can we focus on consistency of verb tenses, subject verb agreement, and prepositions? So class, we have just discussed the four criteria, okay? Fluency, pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar now. I am going to ask you, of the four criteria, in which criterion are we getting the highest average? Okay, you only have four options, right? Fluency, pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar. Pick one. Can you tell me which criterion, okay, are Filipinos getting the highest average? So far, Mark, Janelle, and Cookie said fluency. IFNG said fluency. Marie's, Jer, Joyce, fluency. Jessa, fluency. What about the others? Okay, Casey said it's pronunciation. At least it's a different answer. GL, fluency. The reason why I'm not moving on is because we have not or I personally have not seen the correct answer yet. Vina is correct. Yes, Filipinos on the average get the highest grade for lexical resource. So imagine a typical, an ordinary Filipino can get seven in vocabulary without preparation. So, how many Filipinos are taking the IELTS? Okay, if we look at the Philippine statistics, before COVID, okay, so that means to say, as of December 2019, because first quarter of last year, that's when COVID started to contribute to the dwindling number of IELTS test takers. So as of December 2019, pre-COVID, 3,000 Filipinos based in PH are taking IELTS. How many go to review centers and how many don't? According to statistics of British Council and IDP, 60 to 70% take the IELTS without enrolling in any preparation course. But how do they know that? Well, for those of you who already registered for the examination, there is this portion, referral agent. So you might want to indicate not applicable or you want to indicate your review center. So according to the big bosses of IDP and British Council, namely... Ms. Hannah Esguera of IDP Philippines, and uh, back then, Sir uh, Ian Cortez of the British Council, or uh, it was turned over to Sir Mike Cabigon, 60 to 70% of the candidates register on their own without indicating any referral agent. So imagine if 60 to 70% of Filipinos take the IELTS without any preparation, you might want to ask why. And that is because of hubris. And what is the hubris? Dangerous overconfidence. Most of them are so complacent and they are thinking, why do I have to prepare for an English examination when in fact I've been communicating in English since birth? But this is exactly the reason why 
this dangerous overconfidence contributed to just 6.8 national average grade in speaking. When most of our nurses need seven, the national average is just 6.8, which means less than 50% of Filipinos get a seven in the speaking subtest. So let's go back. For vocabulary, we are getting seven. That's an average Filipino. So now we already know in which criterion we're getting the highest average. That's why I am going to ask you now. You only have three options left, right? There's fluency, there is grammar and pronunciation. In which criterion are we Filipinos getting the lowest average? Pick one. Is it fluency? Is it pronunciation? Is it grammar? Okay. So far, grammar, 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 pronunciation, grammar, pronunciation, grammar, grammar. Master G is correct. It is fluency. Huh? Totoo ba yun, sir? So, here we are debunking the misconceptions in the IELTS. Prior to this uh, free lecture, most of you were thinking, siguro pinakamataas ang mga Filipinos sa fluency kasi madaldal tayo. Malamang sa malamang, pinakamababa ang mga Filipinos sa grammar. And wrong po yun. This is the reason why I agreed to do the presentation for tonight. Normally, this is an info that I just share in class. But why am I uh, disclosing this information to the public? I mean, this is aired on Facebook right now. And you can take my word for it. Because when I represented the Philippines in Shanghai from December 1 to 5, 2017, I learned vital information that I told myself I'm going to share with my fellow citizens, with my kababayans who are preparing for the examination. And you deserve to know that normally we get the highest in vocabulary with or without preparation and we get the lowest in fluency. Why? Okay, this is what I've learned from IELTS examiners. They know for a fact if a candidate is from the Philippines or is Filipino because we give exactly the same answers. I'll give you a perfect example, okay? May I ask you, I need you to type the first answer that comes to mind. Okay, game, get ready. Okay, let's do some stretching. It's 10.34, I hope you're still awake, alert, alive, and enthusiastic. Here we go. The first one, animal that you find interesting, type it and then enter. Animal that you find interesting, you see, oh, dog ka agad. Alam na alam na Pinoy. Why? If it's animal, dog. Wala na ba ibang hayop te? Mm. Now, I asked IELTS examiner, so what's the difference between seven and nine? And this is what I've learned from them. A lot of people are able to speak English correctly, but not everyone sounds smart when talking in English. Blessed are those who display intelligence for they will get the highest grade in fluency. So fluency is not just about your ability to open your mouth. It's your ability to display intelligence, to speak with substance. Ay, ganun pala yun. So, according to Maris, nag-iisip pa, hehe, from cookie, true nga. O, oh, diba? Because when we speak of animal, dog ka agad. So now, if I may ask you once again, now, I need to think of a more unique answer. Something that the examiner has never heard before. Something the examiner hears for the very first time. Okay. An animal you find interesting. Type your answer. Yung pangmalakas ang sagot, ha? Why anong dinosaur? Patay na yung dinosaur, te. 
Meerkat. Oy, sosyal. Sino yun si Miss Eds? Meerkat. Pasok sa ba nga yung ganong sagot? Okay, kangaroo, hyena, flamingo, elephant, cookie. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Black panther. Pheasant. Piglet. Komodo dragon, chimpanzee. Would you like to ask me the animal that I find interesting? The animal that I find interesting is the platypus because it is the only animal that is both a mammal and an amphibian. Oh, di ba? Kailangan ganun. You have to think of something that will get the attention of the examiner and you have to make sure that you sustain this until the very end. Akala, unicorn. Why? Kasi marami akong mga anak na unicorns. Aking background, no. Okay. So that's the first one. Okay. Animal that you find interesting. We don't even know what platypus. Yes, auntie. Okay, search nyo. May platypus. Uh, what, what do you mean? How do we? Yan ba yung parang duck? My Google. Okay, check nyo kaya. Now, let, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's think of something different, okay? Ayan, oh, gising na sila. Best in, best in, best in participate na. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask this question twice. Now, I need you to give me the answer that comes to your mind First, okay, the very first answer that comes to your mind. Not the creative answer, ha? The top of mind answer. Are you ready? Favorite flower. Go. Favorite flower. Enter. Type your answer. Favorite flower. Jasmine. Okay. Rose. Oh, young rose. Very Filipino young rose. Sunflower. Okay. <laughs> I hate flowers. Ellie, you don't have a choice, but you still have to talk. Why? It's not as if you can choose your question. You are not given the liberty to tell your examiner, oh, my dear examiner, why are you asking me this question? Your only choice is to open your mouth and, uh, and talk about flowers. Okay. Sampagita is not necessarily wrong, but imagine if you're assigned to a white examiner who encounters Sampagita for the very first time. The examiner might ask you, what is Sampagita? We don't have it in the UK. Will you please describe it in English? Some of us might easily find words to describe Sampagita, but some of us might not find the right words. That is why it is best to avoid answers that are not in English. So say, for instance, you're asked about your favorite food, please do not say adobo, dinakdakan, dinindeng, pigar-pigar, dangit. The examiner might say, okay, what is dangit? What is pigar-pigar? What is uh, dinakdakan? Now, if you're asked about your favorite food, you say fish and chips, uh, beef steak, a fried chicken, so that you don't have to explain it in English. Okay? Oh, sige, pinaputok na tilapia. How are you going to describe that in English? Don't put yourself on boiling water. Do not feed yourself to the lions. Okay? Make it easy for you because after all, this is not a lie detector test. IELTS does not assess your ability to uh, stick to the truth from beginning to end. It's not like that. IELTS assesses your ability to communicate in English. So the moment you mention terms that are not in English, you are forced to say something or you're, say something about this foreign term, okay? From Arjafel. Fried chicken na lang po. O, tama, di ba? Because you don't have to make it complicated. What's most important, you're able to get your point across. But let's go back to flowers. Now, that particular question came out in my very own IL. So what did I say when I was asked that question? Oh, definitely. My favorite flowers are the dashing daffodils of Florida. Oh, pa, the dashing daffodils of Florida. 
daffodil is not as common as rose, uh, sunflower, sampagita. Plus, if I may share this experience, it was in 2009, okay? Michael Kinsey, a, a white examiner, was sent to Baguio. And then, he is this kind of examiner who sticks to the task cards, okay? Who depends on this script. So the task card assigned to him, tell me something about your favorite flower. So the first Filipino said, oh, my favorite flower is rose. The second candidate said, oh, my favorite flower is rose. So the, the examiner thought, oh, wow, what a coincidence that the first and second candidates love rose. Third candidate, my favorite flower is rose. Not the red rose, but white rose. Te, rose pa rin yan. Kulay lang ang iniba mo. So, the, exam the examiner went out of the cubicle and then called the, called the attention of all the other candidates in the waiting room. If anyone will give me flower as an answer, I will mark you down. Are you talking about a uh, are, are you discussing amongst yourselves? what you're supposed to say. So IELTS examiners don't want to hear something that they have heard before. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So now let us go back to that exact question. Same question. But now think of something that the examiner has never heard before. Okay. Your favorite flowers. Come on. Let me see. Wag santan. Wag sampagita, wag sunflower, wag rose. Oh, my Arabian jasmine, my refle okay, peony, tulip, gumamela. Well, it's not in English. That's why you have to look for uh, the right terms to describe that in English. Hibiscus. Wow. Dandelion. I think you're getting what I'm saying now, right? Now, let, let's move on to another question. Uh, mesmerizing tulips of Holland. Ah, oh, I like it when you add a descriptive word before tulips. Why? If you're able to use adjectives and adverbs correctly, that will help you in getting a higher grade for vocabulary. Now, next, are, are you ready? The next question. Once again, I'm going to mention it twice. The first time, I need you to tell me the, the answer that comes first to your mind, okay? I don't mind if it's common. I just want to hear the first answer that comes to your mind. So here we go. Your favorite part of your house. Go, go, go. Your favorite part of your house. What's the first answer that comes to your mind? Favorite part of your house? Living room? It's a shawl. It's my my patio pang nalalaman. Veranda, bedroom, coffee corner, bedroom, game room. Sana all my game room. Rooftop. Okay, comfort room. Okay, clarification, guys. The term comfort room is used only in the Philippines. We don't want you to use the word comfort room when you are in another country, especially in US, UK, Canada, Australia, Ireland, New Zealand, because they don't really use the term uh, they don't really use the term comfort room. Okay, it's more of a bathroom, a washroom, water closet, a powder room, but please do not say comfort room because when you say that to a native speaker, that native speaker might be thinking, oh my God, what's happening in the comfort room? Is this a place where I go to uh, go to find comfort? So think of something else, okay? Now, when I started teaching IELTS 15 years ago, whenever I ask this question, your favorite part of your house, there are only two answers that I frequently hear. And what are these? Living room and bedroom. Well, some people say kitchen. It's just that if the examiner has heard of this answer a hundred times, a thousand times before, how are you going to stand out from the rest of the examinees? Now, you're going to ask me, 
what's my favorite part of my house? Well, my favorite part of my house is my symbolic staircase. It's not your typical staircase. It's a symbolic staircase because I can compare this a lot like my life. When I'm in the middle of the staircase and I look downwards, the steps remind me of the problems I've encountered in life. And when I look at the upper half of the staircase, they remind me of the obstacles that I'm about to encounter in the future. But that's totally fine because they will help me become a better person. Ganong klaseng sagutan if you want to stand out from the rest. It's not a complicated answer. You just have to think of something different. So now, I'll ask you once again, I need you to be creative. Think of something different, not your typical answer. If you want to get a higher grade for the first criterion, pang Miss Universe, oh, ganun talaga dapat, okay? Pang malaka. Asan? Don't uh, complicate things by uh, using words just to impress the examiner. We want you to communicate your thoughts. You get the attention of the examiner by making or by thinking of something that will capture the interest of the examiner. That's what I'm saying. Okay? So now... Once again, I'll ask you, favorite part of your house? But this time, the uncommon answer, okay? Let me know which part of the house closet because I want to get out of mine. Oh my God! <laughs> Panalo yan, okay? Masigabang palakpakan para kay MC. This is a symbolic answer. Diba? Oh, my closet because I want to get out of mine. Check ka dyan. 9.0 yan. Yung ganyang sagutan. Okay. Porch? Garage? Arsenal, <laughs> 9.0 yan. Yes! That's how you're supposed to answer. Okay. Flower-scented patio. Oh, prayer room. I'm sure you're getting the hang of it. So, what is it that I need you to do? What I want you to do is to go through the speaking task cards and then think of an answer that you might want to discuss in the actual exam. You don't have to memorize word for word, but just think of something that you're likely to talk about in the actual exam. Preparation is important. So in the actual examination, when this question comes out, you don't get to be panicky. All you have to do is to deliver the answer that you thought of beforehand, not memorized beforehand. So why is it that some people are nervous? They are nervous because they know they are not prepared. But when you are mentally tough, when you have prepared enough before the examination, then you don't let nervousness get in the way because you know that you have the arsenal, the weaponry that will maximize your chances. It's not as if you'll just wait for the stars to align and wait for the examiner to give you a seven in speaking. Or you're not going to look at your uh, the palm of your hands and say, it is written in the palm of my heart hands that I'm going to get a seven in speaking. Walang ganun Mars. You have to think of you have to prepare prior to the examination that's why we appreciate the efforts of uh, ifng to come up with a group like this where students and uh, future ielts passers are able to practice their skill in the speaking subjects of course with the proper guidance of the moderators okay and it's 10 50 PM, I spoke to the moderators of IFNG. I'm, I'm supposed to talk about uh, task one, task two, task three, how to 
describe yourself in a non-stereotypical, non-conventional, non-traditional manner. But I'm afraid we might not have enough time for that. But nothing to worry because I think we have agreed already that this is not going to be our last session. So we're going to have more sessions uh, with you guys. It's totally free of charge. So you see... There's no participant tonight who paid something to attend this free lecture because for me, sharing is loving, okay? You don't have to be our reviewee for me or for us to help you pass the examination. I share what I know so we maximize that information, use and abuse it until such time that we take the examination we are ready and we are prepared. So now, we have uh, approximately nine minutes. So we're going to answer questions like, there's a question here from Master G as I answer this question. Let's wait for the others to type. Do I uh, lose marks when I do not answer all bullets from part two, sir? Okay, clarification. What's most important is you are able to discuss an answer that encompasses okay, the general question. Some people give lengthy introductions until such time that they're not able to hit the target. They're not able to hit the bullseye. So if there are almost 35 examiners in the Philippines, and I've met more than 20 of them, what I've learned from them for some examiners, it's fine if you don't answer all of the bullet points, but there are those who insist that you answer all of those. We want you to be prepared regardless of the examiner because you cannot choose your examiner. I mean, when will you find out who your examiner is? When you arrive at the venue, that's when you get to know who's the person uh, in charge of interviewing you. you. You cannot pick your examiner. You just have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. You have to be prepared for all possible situations. And this is exactly the reason why. It is best that you answer all of the bullet points because there are examiners who expect you to discuss all of the bullet points. Fine, by all means, if you're assigned to someone who accepts a general answer without tackling all the bullet points. But what if you're assigned to someone who expects that you address all of the bullet points? That's exactly why we are telling you we always go for the safe approach. And what is the safe approach in the speaking subtest? Please answer all the bullet points within one to two minutes so that you are safe regardless of the examiner, okay? From Camille, what if I don't use idioms at all? Is it okay? Okay, now before I answer Camille, some of you guys were with me since 9 p.m. Question, have you heard me use idioms since 9 p.m.? Master G, no. Vina. No. iPad? No. Jessa? Not at all. Kath? No. Cookie? No. Now, I just have to bring this out, okay? Because it was asked. So, I took the IELTS twice. One academic, one general training, one in IDP, and one in British Council. So, for listening, reading, and speaking, in one of two attempts, I got nine. And in one out of two attempts, 8.5. So that means to say my highest in listening, reading, and speaking, 9. My lowest in listening, reading, speaking, 8.5. Consistently for both attempts, IDP and British Council Academic and General Training, my writing grade, 8.0. But normally, for someone like me whose background is statistics, Statistical writing as I finished a degree in BA communication research. But I, like what I've said, it's a statistical writing course. We are not fond of idioms. So how come I got a 9 in speaking in one of two attempts and 8.5 in speaking even without idioms? That's because idioms are not necessarily required. Clarification. It doesn't mean you will fail if you don't use idioms. It doesn't mean you will automatically pass if you don't use idioms. Because idioms are just one. One component of lexical resource as a criterion. If you're able to use one idiom correctly, good for you. If you're not able to use idioms, 
fine. You don't have to force yourself to use an idiom, okay? So straight from someone who has devoted almost half of his life teaching the IELTS, straight from someone who has represented the Philippines in international conventions in the IELTS, straight from someone who has spoken personally to more than 20 of the 35 examiners in the Philippines, you are not required an idiom to get a seven in speaking. You won't necessarily pass the IELTS speaking subtest if you use an idiom, and you won't automatically fail just because you did not use an idiom. If you want to use an idiom, make sure it's correct. If you want to use an idiom, one or two will do in the entire 11 to 14 minute speaking exam, okay? So let's move on to the other questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, wait a minute. Will you offer discount or scholarship to attendees of this form of the enroll in your formal IELTS review program? Okay. Well, I'm not a person. I, I'm not the kind of person who is a hard seller, okay? In fact, what did you notice since I started teaching at 9 p.m.? I never mentioned about our review program. So because it was asked, I'm going to answer. Okay, for those of you who do not know, we have our summer promo this month of May. So for the benefit of those who do not know yet, if you enroll as an individual, it's 4,000 pesos unlimited for one year divided by 365 days. It's like spending 11 pesos per day. Uh, mas mahal pa po ang plain rice at mini stop at 15 pesos. So if you enroll as a group of four persons, that's 3,500 per head. But what's the catch? What's, inclus uh, what's included? For our schedule, we conduct 14 hours of live and interactive lectures every day from 9 to 12 in the morning, 1 to 4 in the afternoon, 4 to 6 in the evening, 6 to 9 in the evening, and 9 uh, to 12 midnight. So 14 hours, there's always a lecturer discussing something about IELTS. The lecture might focus on listening, reading, writing, speaking, uh, grammar, pronunciation, vocabulary, accent neutralization, content development, skills enhancement, common mistakes. But it does not end there. Because even if we have 14 hours of live and interactive lectures daily, we also have one-on-one -on -one coaching 24-7, okay? We're trying to compete with uh, Alpha Mart or Family Mart Char. I'm just giving you an idea that we have a reviewee from all habitable continents because of our 27, uh, 24 7 review program. So, wherever you are, even if you're uh, in Ethiopia, uh, even if you're in Suriname or Northern Marianas or Sweden or Palau or Papua New Guinea, there is a coach assigned to accommodate your coaching needs. And we guarantee that we offer one-on-one -on -one coaching for 365 days in a year. Why can we promise that? Because if you were here at the beginning of the lecture, Sir Marvin mentioned that yes, we have 60 coaches who handle one-on-one -on -one coaching. So this is exactly the reason why we can accommodate up to 400 students for one-on-one -on -one coaching every single day because I micromanage. I always look at the coaching slots. I, I'm, I'm the one responding to the messages sent to our Facebook account. I get to see everything. And because of this, I listen to the clamor of our reviewees and I always try to give them something new. In fact, we have more like... Before the end of the month, we're also going to give uh, free lectures, uh, free reviewers for NCLEX. If you're going to America, we're also planning to uh, do the same for the UK bound applicants, like free CBT uh, preparation, free OSCE preparation. And in the coming months, we're planning to talk to our uh, partner visa consultants and recruitment agencies to you know, maximize your chances of going there because IELTS, OET, that's just a piece of the puzzle. The, the bigger picture is really to secure a visa. That's why 
if you ask nine reviewees who are currently enrolled in the program, they know that I'm very involved. Like almost every day, I communicate with them in the group chat, send them new offers, new benefits at no extra cost. So that's just to answer the, the question that was asked earlier. Uh, can we possibly possibly give a, a discount? We will get already have a promo. So that's 4,000 if you enroll individually, 35 if you enroll as a group of four persons. Okay, so Janelle, I can get easily intimidated when I know I'm talking to someone with expertise. How can I overcome this? It's all in the mind, my dear. Why? The mind is the one that dictates. If you tell yourself that you can't make it, then you let your emotions eat you up. But if you are in control of the situation, then definitely it's just mind over matter. It starts from within. If you tell yourself that, okay, I will be intimidated, then you will be overwhelmed. But if you tell yourself, I have the guns to communicate with this person, even if I know that this person is an expert, well, you will end up victorious because I tell you, it's just mental conditioning. From Abigail, uh, wait, lang wala. Uh, in part two, should we follow the order? Not necessarily for as long as you answer. Well, it's best that you answer all of those. The bullet points are there to help you come up with an organized or structured approach, but it doesn't mean that it has to be in that order. Miss Ed, so what if the examiner interrupted the candidate in part three, despite explaining the answer and trying to give examples and proceed to the next question and said, is it a bad sign? No, in fact, my examiner never allowed me to talk for more than four sentences per response. And yet I was able to get nine in my uh, in, in one attempt and 8.5 in another attempt. So like what I've said, it's totally normal for the examiner to butt in while you're talking. Don't be too conscious. For as long as your English is correct, your English is flawless, and you sound well-informed, you're someone who sounds smart while you're talking, then there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh-huh. From FB Live, is it true that if you take your exam in the Philippines, it is more difficult than outside the Philippines? Well, there is an ongoing rumor, but I don't want to confirm this as some Filipino examiners are assigned to other countries while white examiners travel from one country to another. So it, there is a possibility that this month, this examiner is interviewing candidates in UAE, but next month, that examiner is in the Philippines. And the following month, that examiner will be assigned to another Middle Eastern country like Saudi Arabia. So I don't want to agree with this, okay? Oh, we have 11 messages. Uh, Mastery, thank you, thank you. Uh, RJ, enroll na mga suki. Clarification, hindi po ako ang nagsabing mag-enroll na po kayo. If you think that we can help you, then thank you for choosing us. But if you don't think we are the right people for you, it's totally fine, okay? We are not hard sellers. We are not pushy. Mac J, mahal pa ang rice. True, 15 ang rice. Ang review sa Niner, 11 pesos per day. So what if you miss some of the classes? The dashboard right now contains more than 120 hours of recorded lectures. So I'm not just, well, Niner is not just about Irvin. Other lecturers are Sir Brian Martin Shawson, who got nine in writing, nine in speaking, nine overall band score, nine in listening, and nine in reading. So if I'm done with my five consecutive weeks, I'm thinking the next five weeks after me, Sir Brian might be doing it. And then the next five weeks, it could be Sir Philip who got nine overall band score, nine in speaking, nine in reading, nine in listening with an eight in writing. Guys, this is not uh, being boastful or what. We want you to know that you are in good hands. So more than anything else, credibility is everything. You cannot just entrust your future to someone who, number one, has not taken the exam or number two, has scored a grade lower than nine in any component. So our lecturers were not born, or they, they were not made overnight. I have taught IELTS for 15 years. Sir Fritz Nolasco has taught at Niner for 14 years. Sir Jeff, 13 years. Sir Philip, 13 years. Sir Brian, 12 years. Kung sa Tagalog, pinagtibay na po kami ng panahon, kahit pa siguro tulog kami, kaya naming magturo. 
Okay, how about phrasal verbs? Phrasal verbs, as long as they are used correctly, are actually encouraged. We always go back to the basics. Is it accurate? Is it correct? If yes, you are safe. Family Mart, the best. True, my Family Mart na malapit dito sa amin. I love the food. IFNG, Zimbabwe. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Wait, I cannot scroll down. Thank you so much. You're too generous for this lecture. So, so lively at 11 p.m. For my reviewees, they know that my energy is consistent from the time I woke, uh, I wake up at 7.30 a.m. all the way to 11.30 p.m. Same energy level. And an ampersand also is the same. What exactly do you mean, uh, Gretzo? <laughs> Kindly rephrase your question. Maybe there's something I did not quite get. Miss Eds, I highly appreciate this free lecture, sir. So informative. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This is what it's all about. It's about us helping you get your required band score. You know what? I don't have other skills in life. I cannot cook. I cannot drive. I cannot sing. I cannot dance. But I can talk. So with this God-given skill, why not help it? To uh, Why not hone it? To help others in reaching for their dreams. More messages. Kasama na sa panaginip ang pag-lecture. True. Mac J, in part three, it's not appropriate to use you when answering the answer. It's like addressing the examiner. It, it depends on the question. If it's asking the question, if, if, the, uh, if the question requires you to use the word you, then by all means, go ahead. Speaking is not as technical as writing. Writing is more technical. But speaking, you just have to speak your heart out. You just have to be conversational. Cookie, dami kong natutunan and dami kong tao. Eh, how much more kung face-to-face, -face, ba? Mas pasok sa banga. Is it better to say I'm instead of I am? I'm, I am, they're the same to me. They're not wrong, okay? As long as it's correct, and it's not colloquial, it's acceptable in English, you are on the right track. Is it a bad sign if the examiner keeps asking follow-up question with why? No. In fact, I share this during our paid lectures. The more the examiner argues with you, the more the examiner loves you. It's useless for an examiner to argue with someone who cannot argue back. But if the examiner feels that your mental faculties are superior and that you can carry out an argumentation or a debate, that's when the examiner is trying to bring out the best in you. It's something that I, I discuss in detail in the review proper, but for now, to answer your question, it's not necessarily wrong or it's not necessarily a bad sign if the examiner keeps on asking why. Centrum complete, char. Sana o, kahit speaking lang ang talent ko, kaso wale. Lols. Is it okay to repeat the word, I believe? I'm not fond of um, candidates who use exactly the same terms. Like, you say, I believe once fine. But if you keep on saying it like in every response, why don't you settle for something different the next time around? Like, I assert, uh, I, I surmise, I propose to my mind, I am of the, of the opinion that. And this is why you need experts to help you in coming up with something that's not repetitive. Okay. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. You've learned a lot. Thanks for the free lesson. You're welcome. You're welcome. So it's 11.09 p.m. Allow me to thank uh, Sir Jeff, Sir Marvin, uh, Miss Gladys, uh, also for Miss Jess for inviting me to be your speaker for tonight. If you have feedback, we can just send your feedback to the moderators of IFNG. Uh, if given the opportunity to uh, to communicate with you guys once again and be your lecturer for next week, I'd rather talk about writing tasks too because our national average in the writing subtest is just 6.1. So imagine if in speaking we're at 6.8 but writing is 6.1. Really have to work double time to get our numbers up, especially if you are targeting UK, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, where they require 6.5 to 7 in writing. And if our national average is 6.1, then the target of 6.5 to 7 is nowhere near. 
Okay, uh, Sir Marvin, uh, Miss Gladys, thank you. Do you have Hi, anything sir. to say? Thank you for that informative lecture, sir. We're happy that you're been part of the IFNG. And we're looking forward for the next lecture. Sir. Okay, so on behalf, of our, on behalf of our members, sir, we would like to thank you for gracing us your presence tonight and then uh, sharing us your lecture with regard to the myths that should be debunked uh, about IELTS. So hopefully next week we will see you again, same time and same Zoom. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> thank you, Sir Irvin. I hope and the participants did not mind that I did not use any PowerPoint presentation. In fact, uh, Sir Marvin and Miss Gladys asked me if I can provide them with a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. beforehand. I just told them, I just open my mouth when I teach. I, yeah. I don't need any presentations. <laughs> We do need it, sir. <laughs> Laway lang. <laughs> Laway lang puhunan, charms. Okay, so thank you, everyone. So I hope you enjoyed our presentation and the lecture of Sir Irvin. So looking forward for you to attend again on for next week. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, sir Irvin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.